This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Wayne Godfrey, man. How you doing, Wayne? Alex, really good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Uh, I'm excited to get into the weeds with you about uh, your your very interesting uh, ex- career so far in the film industry. And you're a young guy. You're, we're, we're of similar vintages, uh, but you know you've done a lot for a guy of your age, and uh, and what you've done in the business is pretty uh, pretty extraordinary. So. Um, but before we go into all of that, how did you get into this ridiculous business? Oh, wow. Um, well, you say I'm a young guy, but yeah, I can't even remember that. So, uh, no, it was, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to start as a runner. So, um, I began really my whole career at, um, a post company in the UK called Goldcrest, mm-hmm. one of the, um, um, post houses in the UK and, You know, I started one day by knocking on the door, putting my CV in, needing a job in, you know, uh, in in London and trying to really figure out what the whole concept of movie making was all about. And I actually was a bit of a DJ back then. So I was very interested in sound and the behind the scenes of uh, of finishing movies and began being a post runner at Goldcrest in London. And from there, learn about the business of making films. Um, and I had fantastic teachers in John Quested, Tony Murphy, Stephen Johnson, who were these old school, um, um, you know, indie film guys who were, um, you know, expert teachers of showing how to take a movie, take it to a market like can, package it up and sell it to a bunch of buyers and, and actually monetize what a movie is. And this was a whole new world for me as a young kid, because mm-hmm. we just movies, you go and buy them, you didn't think about how they got there in the first place. And this was a whole new kind of education. Um, and so that's how it all began, um, really as a runner, right from the bottom up. Now, so the the the, uh, the concept of like packaging a film and, and, and making money with a film is so, I mean, look, the the film business is the only business in the world where you could spend $100 million on a product and it's worthless. I mean, it's the only, it, like you spent $100 million on a building, you got a building. <laughs> you would think, and also a lot of, a lot of um, you know, kind of thought and market research and care and probably pre-selling goes into um, you know, identifying whether you should spend $100 million on that building in the first place. Right. Um, as opposed to maybe developing it in a little silo. Um with a few of your mates <laughs> thinking this is a great idea. Um, but no, I think, I think, you know, there's different ends of the film spectrum. The hundred sure. million dollar blockbusters are a- immense businesses in their own right. Of and um, I, I'm fortunately I'm not in that arena. Um, I've never <laughs> been in that arena. It's an amazing arena. They make amazing movies, but I'm in the, the other end of the mm-hmm. arena, the sure. film end. Um, but whether it's a hundred million or a million, it's still it's a significant still... amount of money mm-hmm. that you are, I don't want to say gambling, but you are rolling the dice on really, um, you know, putting together these these businesses and establishing whether or not can you find an audience. And that's a very interesting proposition. And, you know, I think as a producer, you're ultimately creating businesses. Every film is their own business. Right, exactly. Because, you know, you could spend a million dollars on a movie, but... It's like you need when you when you build when you build a cookie you bake a cookie for on, on the smallest spectrum you 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 make a package of cookies you need to find a customer base for that cookie and generally most human beings on the planet will enjoy that cookie because cookies are cookies it's sugar it's flour it's milk and all that kind of stuff with a film it's so more complex and now in today's world is even more complex because and as I'm sure you know from the moments when you started off to today. There's a few more movies in the marketplace now. So it's been diluted with a lot of, for lack of a better word, crap um, from a lot of things that might might need to be there, might not need to be there. But even if they're all amazing films, it's still a tremendous amount of content that you're fighting for attention. So how do you kind of break through with some of your projects? Just to that point, I think the other thing to think about is you're not just competing against the new round of movies. Oh. You're competing with every movie that's ever been made ever so Um, jaws star wars (laughs) it's it's all available to click on a button now for free or very affordably with the streaming um subscription model so suddenly 
what we've this incredible shift in consumption that's occurred over the last few years with the the plethora of movies that are available the catalog as well as the new uh, content it is incredibly competitive um mm-hmm. but that's a great opportunity as well because whereas the barrier to entry was um you know quite high to make mm-hmm. a movie um and actually get distribution and get your product out there and in some respects now the uh, availability of resources and technology and reduction in cost of making movies has enabled really independent filmmakers to really be able to tell a story and find an audience and find a home which wasn't so easy many you know five ten years ago but again the key question is how do you identify what story is the right story to make and how do you stand out in the crowd i guess that's a that's a key question and unfortunately i don't have the exact answer if i did i would be making a lot more of those movies um but, but that's the thing there's like no real there's no real formula like yeah like a cookie yeah, yeah a cookie's a recipe it's not hard and it's been done a million times it's now just about maybe some nuances and marketing and packaging and things like that maybe some new ingredients and things and but movies every movie's a, a new beast a new thing Look at it as uh, Alex, like the three pillars of every movie. There are there. Are, you need three pillars. Well, you don't need three. You need two. Story is the star. I don't really care how much you're spending on it, who's in it. If your story is golden, you have a chance. But it's a bit wobbly. You've only got <laughs> one pillar. So you need another pillar, and that will be maybe capital, money, investment, budget. So if you had a load of money and a really good story, but no one you know in it, you've got a, you know, you've got a shot. You get that third pillar in, which is your talent, your recognizable names, your quality director, whether they're new or old. Um, you know, you've got a solid foundation of building the bricks of that house. Three pillars, a foundation of a great chance of making a successful movie. Now, you move one of the pillars or two of the pillars, you had a load of money and no story and no talent, you can make it. It's a bit wobbly, but you might get it made. Similarly, you could have the best actors in the world, no story, no money. It can be challenging. So it's all about finding the right dynamic and the right, um, I guess, uh, the balance of story, talent and capital. Right. And and well, well let me ask you. So, so I get asked constantly by filmmakers, about how do you get money for your movies? How do you raise financing for your films? And I, I always tell them a very similar thing to what you say. It's like, you know, it all depends. And there's also the genre involved here. So there's that, there's that other pillar, which is genre, because if you have all of those things and it's a drama, it's a much tougher sell um, to sell it internationally. It depends on the talent, of course. It all, that's the thing with all of this stuff. It's all variable. Like, it, like, oh, well, Meryl Streep's in it, but I've seen movies with Meryl Streep in it that don't do money in the box office, even though it's Meryl Streep and the story was good and things like that. So what advice do you have for filmmakers who are trying to raise financing for their half a million dollar budget movie or a quarter million dollar budget movie or a million dollar budget movie? What advice do you have in today's marketplace, which is pretty insane <laughs> for financing? Uh, it, is. it is, it is, it is. I mean, that's a really good question. I think it, there are a number of variables that one has to consider with what's the best advice for that question. So the first mm-hmm. thing is, what is the budget level? What are you trying to achieve? What are your expectations, both for you as the filmmaker and for your investors? So that's a very important thing to start with. Just like any business, you're, a movie is a business. You are starting a new company. So this new company has an objective. Make the asset and distribute it to hopefully generate a return on investment. So what is the most efficient way to make it? What is the right and appropriate budget level? That is a normal mm. thing that people kind of jump over. Some movies are made too small and some movies are made too big. What is the a- appropriate budget level for the movie? And that is very much an equation of where is its home? Where will it land? Where do you think the best opportunity is to monetize the movie? We are in a golden age of distribution with the streamers and broadcasters, but that doesn't make it any easier to license to them or to sell to them. You still need a quality story. You still need to package it. You still need to potentially have a great execution. So, but you know that your upside is capped. You're not got that box office, um, you know, uh, super sky high potential return. You pretty much have a limited or capped return when you license to a streamer. 
because they buy it for a fixed amount of money. And it doesn't matter whether one person watches it or, you know, everyone watches it. You're pretty much getting that a fixed amount of money. So what is your expectation for the movie? What is the direction of travel? And I think um, raising capital in this market requires... Like, I mean, it's never been easy. Let's be honest. It, it, it just, it's never been easy to raise money. So you have to look at, in my view, it's always about, and I, my whole approach has always been about offsetting as much risk as possible for any investor or lender entering into an investment in a film. As a strategy, the hat I wear has always been low risk and, um, and, and, and kind of a, get in, get out and do another one. And it's a different strategy. And there's no, it's not the only strategy, not the best strategy. It's just the way that my head works. I always look to pre-sell or to offset risk with any kind of quantifiable revenue stream, which may affect my upside. It may reduce the potential of the home run, but it is going to certainly reduce the, the likelihood of a wipeout. So, and, so to use that analogy, I love the home yeah. run analogy because so many filmmakers go up to bat and they're always expecting the home run. They're always expecting the box office hit. But what's not sexy is the bunt, the uh, the single, the, the the base hit, stealing a base, pushing another yeah. man to base. At the end of the day, you have runs coming in, runs coming in. Is it as sexy every as a grand time. slam? Is it as, as sexy as a grand slam with everybody on base? No. I'm people buying t-shirts with my name on it you know and uh, maybe they want my autograph after the man, the game and i'm not i'm not really into baseball so i don't really can't really play the analogy as well as someone else could you know if it was football soccer i got I'd it be all over but right right you're absolutely right i'm the guy who's just going to get on first base every time but every time and right. as opposed to one in 20 i get a home run which will be great in that 20th but the 19 oh. before have been hell now, it's okay almost if one in 20 covers the cost of the 19 before, because if that's a strategy, a portfolio approach where we'll put in X amount of money in seven movies on the basis that one or two will hit, the rest might not, but the one or two will cover in spades all the other uh, investments, that's okay as well. It's just not really how my head works. So I've always gone for the ones, the singles, get in, get out, get our money back and go again. And and that's one of the reasons I think that, you know, I've had a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of movies that I've been yeah, involved yeah, in. Yeah, it's an obscene because, amount. It's an obscene amount of movies you've made. <laughs> because I, I don't have that kind of, um, you know, that emotional attachment to these movies. In the, while I'm in them, they're still my babies. Don't get me wrong. I love them. But they're not about, um, you know, nurturing this little child to fruition forever and then living with it and never letting it leave the house and you know staying till they're a teenager and thinking gosh is it ever going to leave you know i'm kind of like get out the house go move on <laughs> on another one um... <laughs> no I, I completely understand and and um but I have to ask you because, I, I, you know, my show and, and I've been known to, you know, talk about uh, the darker side of distribution, which is the predatory distribution I've companies. Heard, I've heard some of your thoughts. You've, you've heard some of my thoughts? Okay. So, yes, yes you've heard of some, a few of them. So I was also listening to your, your fantastic audio book uh, oh, as well. Oh, really interesting. Oh, thank you. And which which the one? The talk about the hustle. Oh, the, the film latest one that you're promoting. The, I, I, I'm film sorry, entrepreneur. I'm the film entrepreneur. Yes, film. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> it's terrific. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, but so, so, I'm assuming with 125 plus projects you've done, you have been paid on time, perfectly from every single deal you've ever made from every oh, distributor. Fail. I mean, literally, sometimes they just send me money. I don't even ask for it. It's absolute <laughs> pleasure. It's a pleasure. So if anyone listening, there's a lot of sarcasm right now running in the room. Uh, so so how do you, what are your experiences when, and I'm assuming early on in your career, probably, I don't know if you still run into these problems now, but um, but earlier in your career, I'm sure you had to deal with issues like this. And I'm sure you probably dealt it throughout your career. Yeah, and it's not an issue that is, um, you know, isolated to any one individual. It's just the way the industry works. You know, as you've said, and I hear you talk about it, we live in a very opaque industry. 
um, with studio accounting. I know you use that reference. Uh, yeah, Hollywood, as, Hollywood hey, accounting, Hollywood accounting, yeah. Hollywood accounting. Um, and, you know, uh, I mean, we'll talk about it soon, hopefully. But, you know, one of the kind of drivers of, of, of starting Purely, my, mm-hmm. my, my latest company, was because of my frustration with the lack of transparency mm. and the opaque reporting and the kind of, well, just the, 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 we're dealing with millions of dollars of assets, as you talked about at the beginning, high risk ventures that require millions of dollars of investment. You spend years developing and making projects, living with them every minute of the day, and then you hand them over to a distributor and you don't hear anything for months, if not years. And then you get a one-page statement that's your report that says nothing with like a few lines that has no detail. And you're thinking, I spent eight years of my life making this thing and this is what I get? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and it doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. And it drives you mad. And so, yes, I have a little bee in my bonnet about the... Um, quality of reporting now that doesn't mean there aren't some fantastic distributors agreed. who agreed. are agreed and respectable and communicate yes. and there are and i've worked with a lot of them and they are fantastic and you know i always try and gravitate to those sorts of individuals in all walks of business life because mm-hmm. people that communicate well in good bad or indifferent tend to be good people to work with mm-hmm. even if it's bad news you're hearing about it um it's a difficult, difficult thing. And I appreciate as well that if you're juggling a lot of distributions and lots of different films and reporting that comes from all these different sources are not instantaneous. So yeah. getting transparent reporting, not even just from the distributor, but from the various retailers or sources of distribution are all very bitty, complicated, different formats, blah, 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 blah. It's hard. It's complicated. So I, I acknowledge that. But there has to be a better way. And um, likewise, as, as creators, as um, participants within a movie, uh, whether you're, you know, an actor, writer, director, costume, uh, you know, if you haven't participated, in a movie, it should you should have a, um, in my view, anyway, a regular and transparent view on how that asset is performing. And you know, you find them out things so late, Alex, that you know you can't do anything to change the life cycle of that asset. What's the point of getting a report nine months after the release to be told it didn't quite work in this way because the marketing wasn't very good? If it were, if you knew about it in real time, you might be able to do something about it. Hell, you might not. In real time, just to, like just within thirty days. It. Within thirty days, yeah. it would be nice. <laughs> So Purely actually was, um, you know, one of the things that Purely kind of, my company, Purely Capital was, um, you know, really came out of this idea that we deserve better transparency. We preserve a, a, a system where you can see how your assets are you know, less opaque and more open and be more inclusive with all the beneficiaries around an asset. Within reason, of course. Right, exactly. And so, uh, yeah. with within purely, Alex, so purely. So, how explain what uh, purely uh, capital is and what it what it's doing and how it's kind of changing the game a little bit for for distributor for for, for filmmakers. Well, um, one of the challenges in this uh, changing face of consumption is we are licensing content increasingly to streaming platforms um, and. You may or may not be familiar, or your listeners may or may not be familiar, that actually when you license to the likes of Netflix, Amazon, Disney, Sky in the UK, Viacom, Comcast, all of these guys, they pay you a license fee, but typically over two to five years. So you can end up with quarterly payments, contracted payments that take quite a long time to get paid. And that is killer. If you've gone and raised that half a million, two million bucks to make that indie film, you know, you've, you've, you've slogged to do that. You know how hard it is to raise that money, but you've achieved that goal. You've made that film. You've then done the, the holy thing of selling it, licensing it to Netflix, Amazon, Disney, whatever. You're winning. And then you decide, and here, you've got to wait 36 months to get paid. It's like, oh, this is hard work. So Purely was designed to basically 
completely accelerate that. So we basically give you the money today and we wait the 36 months for Netflix, Amazon, Disney to pay. So we crystallize that contracted income as soon as you've contracted with that um, SVOD platform or broadcaster and we accelerate the money to your bank account today. So you can refinance your investors, you can go and make your next movie. If you're a distributor, you can go and buy more assets. So to basically keep those businesses, keep these people moving so they don't have to keep waiting for long dated contracted revenues. And that was that's what Purely is all about. That, and that's brilliant because I've heard this. I've heard the same stories from from partners of mine who who've sold to Netflix and and, and to all the streamers. And you're know, like, OK, we got one hundred thousand. Great. Yeah. They're going to start paying at the end of year two. Uh, and and it's going to be over the next four years and it's going to like trickle in little by little. So that hundred grand will essentially be maybe 10 to 15,000 a quarter or something along those lines. And you're just like, you, you'll right. grow old before you get all the money. And it's like, oh my God, this is brutal. And it's like you, you write that email to your investors like, hey, congratulations, <laughs> right? sold to Netflix. And like, oh, by the way, I can't pay you for three years. It's like, oh, what a what a what a bummer. So, you know, I I witnessed this problem firsthand. You know, we had the great, and you know, it is a great you know achievement and feeling when you license to um, a great home. And 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 this not critical on the business models of Netflix, Amazon, Disney. You know, we understand that they have to spend, and they are spending billions of dollars on content to serve their global consumers. Uh, and and subscribers with amazing amounts of content. So if you're lucky enough to be selected and chosen, it's brilliant. But waiting for money just is a pain. It doesn't matter what walk of life, you know. You don't want to chase money. You don't want to wait for it. And and that's what we're trying to solve and trying to find a way to do that in with technology, with efficiency, with a, a standardized approach that creates a. Uh, it, it's super easy for any rights owner, producer or distributor to just crystallize that revenue stream. And it doesn't matter if it's 100 grand. You know, we can do, you know, small amounts of money all the way up to significant millions of dollars at a time. Right. And then I'm assuming you take a percentage of what, like, where's where's the rub yeah, as far as you eat? I mean, come yeah, on. Exactly. So but but the service. Now, yeah, we do, we do a little discount. It's very competitive. It's bank pricing. But yes, sure. we discount money. So. We give you 95 cents on the dollar type thing. Right. Which, I mean, I'll... It, it right. right. That's the difference. So like, okay, you can wait three or four years or I could I could pay you 5% and I have it all now. Yeah. Effectively. Essentially. Effectively. Effectively. Exactly. Whatever that way. Yeah. It's something small. And and then now you're like, okay, great. So now I have that 100 grand. I can then repay my financiers and my investors. And now they're happy because they got their money back. And they're like, hey, can I, can I do another one? Can, yeah. Because I promise you, you if you call, if you call them up and go, hey, I'm waiting for three years for my for uh, you have to pay you. Oh yeah, I have this other project. They're gonna go. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, or, or or could we win the money's back in three years if you still have the project? You know, right. So that's it. But but you know these these are real world problems. Cash flow is a real world problem, and also the time cost of money. The money in your hand today is worth more than it is in three years time because you can do things with it. You can make more films. You can make more money from it. So. You know, we, you know, we're trying to help, but there's more to it than that, Alex. And and, and this alludes to the hunt of transparency and opaque nature of reporting. The whole system is fully transparent. So one of the strategies we're developing in the verticals is to plug in all your revenue streams and provide an instant kind of real time reporting system for films, not just from the distributor, but from the ultimate retailer. So you can see how your assets are performing in real time and then disperse to your beneficiaries also in real time any collected revenue. So really trying to change this idea of having to wait weeks and months for money, but also reporting and information and trying to give it in the palm of your hand on your iPhone or your Samsung, wherever you are in the world, you can be like, oh, this is, we're doing, our, you know, we did, we sold, you know, a thousand units today or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And also I also wanted to ask you, so with, with, where do you see streaming going because and VOD in, in general because I mean there's basically the three categories SVOD, TVOD and AVOD. Uh, AVOD is a very strong uh, place right now for independent film. It's where I see the most revenue being generated for the lower end movies that don't have big stars in it. Um, SVOD obviously if you can get the SVOD deals 
amazing. If you can get a Netflix deal and a you know or a Hulu, nice nice chunk, awesome. TVOD, unless you drive traffic, is pretty much dead in my opinion, or has a star involved. Like if you have a star involved, that means people like, you know, if you got John Travolta throw by or Bruce Willis go by, people will probably rent it because of them. But if you don't have that star and you can't drive traffic, TVOD is essentially a dead issue as opposed to where it was 10, 15 years ago. Do you agree? I, I, I have to agree. I think, I think, I think, as you said, streaming is, uh, SVOD uh, is, is the holy grail. If you can get a license on a, a streamer that will pay you up front or even over two, three years, great. Um, transactional and AVOD are a lot more challenging to quantify value. And with transactional, because of the plethora of free content available on AVOD and through AVOD, and yes, it's not free, you have to watch ads, but you know, in terms of the consumer spend, it, 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 it's time as opposed to cash um, that they're spending. It, 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 in my opinion, it's harder and harder to justify the four ninety nine or seven ninety nine or nine ninety nine acquisition of a rental or purchase of a movie. The commodity of owning an asset, a movie, um, I think it, with the younger generation certainly just doesn't. There's no value to it. Having the box set. I mean, I used to have racks of box sets and physical every, media, my yeah. alphabetical order. Every movie Dude, I used I had to go to. Was, you know, Dude, was, I had I had my I had my color coordinated by studio. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and they were all VHS, and they were all VHS. <laughs> so I was DVD. I was I'm yeah, obviously yeah. a little younger than you. So I, I, I had DVD it. too. I'm not that much older than you, but I, yes. I know, but, okay, so I was DVD, but I I mean, and there was like you know so much joy of picking up the DVD, looking you know watching the box sets. The special features Audio commentary, and, and then yeah. seeing them on the wall, like seeing them, the racks. And I did it with CDs as well. I had, I mean, it was like my thing. I was almost a bit obsessive. I loved it. Um, now, I mean, if I have any, I mean, like, I'm like, I can't have anything physical, you know? I can't have paper. I don't like anything. <laughs> Everything's got to go. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, such a different mindset. So, and to me, the idea of renting or purchasing something where it feels like it could be or should be available on, a, uh, on one of the many subscription platforms or Avod, I think it's harder. But I think niche content and where there's niche audiences, there is going to be a world for, for um, you know, clever targeted marketing to be able to drive transactional revenues. Pricing is also a really key thing. You know, we look at transactional, it's actually, I think, probably overpriced and maybe with the reduction of, rental and purchase uh, as, 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 a, as a price point that could also maintain the lifespan of a transactional opportunity. But discovery is the key, Alex. I mean, how do you find this stuff? As we said, everything is available. Everything. Every movie ever made ever is available. So how do you, how do you stand out in that crowd? And marketing, discovery, influencers, you know, being able to you know, market or identify your audience and communicate with them, that's going to be critical. Yeah. And as filmmakers, I think I've been, well, you've, you've been reading my book. It's about finding that niche, that niche yes. audience, creating product for that niche, creating ancillary revenue streams from that movie, all these other things that you can do. I think that is the future for indie, indie you, filmmakers. It made me feel like um, a, a, a musician. When you were talking like that and when you talk about it in the book, it made me feel like how does an indie artist build a career in, as a musician in this world. I don't think it's too different to an indie filmmaker. You need to build that fan base, that, can, that, that audience that can travel with you and grow with you. And just like a great indie artist can have a fantastic life and career, putting some music out, going gigging, selling some merch, doing some live appearances and have a lovely and, and, and you know, a pretty good life as long as they build the, you know, enough momentum an indie filmmaker can do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then look at the look at the brands that we follow. I mean, Edgar Wright or Scorsese or Spielberg. Now, mind you, most of those names I just mentioned were built in a different time, and and they were they were basically marketed for free by the studios. <laughs> so they they were able to build their brands off the back of the studios. But there's a lot of independent filmmakers coming up now who. And, and again, you don't need millions. You just need a core group that love what you do and you make 
products that for a certain price, sell it to them, act, give them access to those films, and you could do it again and again. I've had people like that on my show who've done like 20 movies in the range of from $5,000 movies to $150,000 movies, even sometimes up to half a million dollars, and they have the same audience following them. And they just and they just keep going and they've built their careers like that. That is the Brilliant. future. But that is but that's work. And a lot of independent filmmakers want to live in the dream world where Spielberg and Scorsese came up in. And that's not the real world anymore, man. It's not. Yeah, I, you say that, but then, you know, you can go and make a really good little indie film and end up with a, you know, a Marvel movie. So, yes, you, know, you, you can you can get plucked out of this little indie pond and put into the sea. It's very um, you, it's you, you, but that's but that's the lottery ticket. Difficult. That's the lottery yeah, that ticket. Is, look, that is it's, it's not, a it's not it's yeah. you're talking about one in a million one in two million filmmakers get that opportunity and i've had other like i've had i always talk about the 90s and the the basically independent film as we know it today started in the 90s there was independent films in the 60s 70s 80s of course but 90s is what we as a, as a society really under kind of grasp independent filmmakers started with the sundance movement so with the Richard Linkletters and the Robert Rodriguez's and That's the Kevin Smith's and all those kind of guys. And I've had the pleasure of speaking to some of these guys. And I talk to them now and I go, so Slacker, would it, would it pop today? You know, yeah. would, Brothers Mc, would Brothers McMullen pop today? And I, when I talked to Ed, Ed was like, yeah, probably not. It was, the, it was a time, right place, right time, right movie. 100%. And, you know, um, um, you know, I think that's a fast, that is a such, um, that's the luck, right? Oh, yeah. But right, right place, right time, right product. Same yeah. in all walks of life, in any business, in any environment, you know, in any industry. It's about right time, right place, right opportunity, right person, right hustle. Um, you know, I mean, my first job, going back to it, you know, like, I was late one day. Something happened because I was stayed late at the office. I, if I, if I, I worked for, um, this chap called Nick Quested, a fantastic filmmaker in New York. And I was in New York. I'd never been in New York before. I didn't know anyone. So I'm in the office late on my own. And then the phone rings. They got a music video. No one's around. I'm helping write this thing. It it pops. Is that luck? Is that hustle? Is that the right timing? Is that because I didn't know anyone in the city? So I ended up being in this, you know, like, what are all the variables that had to happen for that to happen? And you, you go back and think in all aspects of anything that was positive, <clears throat> ultimately it goes back to that story is the star star with a great story you've got everything going for you it's never easy every movie doesn't matter what the budget is how lucky you are to get the right actor director it's hard there are problems on everyone and you just gotta navigate your way through and conduct all the different components i mean this is what i see myself as as a producer a conductor mm -hmm. you're con Seeing all the various moving pieces in this orchestra of a film to try and be hopefully playing the same song in harmony. Yeah, and it's it's not easy at all. No, being a producer, and you know, being a producer at the indie level is it has its own set of um, issues and and challenges. Uh, you know, when you're working on a fifty thousand dollar movie. Which a lot of people are like, how can you make a movie for fifty thousand bucks? I'm like, I made a movie for five grand and sold it to Hulu, so it's possible. Um, but I, it, I mean, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I didn't. I wouldn't know how to do that. I, it's right. Not my it's a. It's a I'm different. Gonna... It's a different skill set. No question. Now you throw yeah. me in a two hundred million dollar project, I'd be like, I probably need some help here, guys. This is not the world. Yeah. I'm, you know, this is a whole other conversation. You have you a know? lot more money, but that also could mean a lot more problems. No, and and also that's just a different mentality, a different way. It's okay. different kind of organization. The politics involved, how to work with people. It's a whole other conversation. Um, but you know, depending on which what kind of um, projects you're working on, creates different. Um, the budget levels create different kind of challenges. So you were talking about being an orchestra. You've worked with some pretty remarkable filmmakers over over your career, like like Martin Scorsese, Rob Reiner, Werner Herzog, Taylor Hackford. How do you conduct <laughs> Scorsese or Herzog? Like how do you? Like, I'm not saying you're like telling them what to do or anything, but how do you kind of work within that kind of uh, that kind of? I mean, these guys when they walk in a room. 
their entire catalog walks in the room with them. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, you mentioned some of the greatest filmmakers that you know have ever existed, and <laughs> you don't, you don't, you know, filmmaking is a collaboration. Right. Um, and right. when you're working with incredible talent, uh, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm never the one to put my hand up and say this is how you do it. Right. Um, especially when I have no clue. Um, I'm not a director. I don't have that skill set. I tried, made a couple of short films. They weren't very good. And I realized quickly that that wasn't my skill set. Um, I love the concept of storytelling. I love the ideas and the generation. I love throwing ideas in the pot. But you're not going to tell specialists and experts what they do. In the same way, I wouldn't tell a doctor what's wrong with me because he's the expert. But I, went so to, I but I went to WebMD. What are you talking about? I went to WebMD.com. I looked it up. Doc, I need this. Google Doc. Google Doc. <laughs> So, um, no, I, I and, and in my role as a producer, I'm typically coming in as a financier. So my role is really specific. I help get these films made. I help put them together. But I'm not the guy on the on the on the Front floor line. of production yeah. over the over the shoulder of the director, giving him a nod like, mm, you know, what about that angle? Like, firstly, no one does that with some of the time we're talking about. But it's just not who I am. I am the deal guy. I'm the guy that helps figure out how to put this together. How do you how do you fit this square peg in the round hole with the amount of available resources we have or the challenges we have and, you know, getting it in, getting it in that hole and getting that hopefully nice and cohesive flowing um, relationship between all the parties. So, um, you know, the relationship I had with some of these directors is, is honestly, in some cases, very hands off very uh, polite and wishing them very well um and in some of the ones it has been a bit more intimate it does depend very much on the relationship and the challenges and the compromises needing to be made by production because the relationship i believe between producer and director is that collaborative um um you know you have to share a shared vision but mm -hmm. sometimes you have different forces the producer is dealing with strains of capital money, investors, shareholders, distributors, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And the director is pushing for his vision, that creative, um, that creative force. And sometimes even where the best one in the world, they're not always aligned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, <laughs> they're not always aligned. So it's about how do you navigate that workplace? How do you navigate that uh, political uh, you know, uh, it's egos, um, personalities, and also knowing when to shut up and be <laughs> like, this isn't the time, the place. And I'm not the guy to, to, to say anything here because it's not going to make anything better right. um, and try and fix problems. And, you know, producing is problem solving. Producing is finding the problem and identifying it hopefully early and solving it before it's even a problem for someone else. That's a great, great definition of what a producer does <laughs> because it's producing is such as like kind of nebulous thing. You're like, because anyone can call themselves a producer. You don't have to go to seven years of school to have, you know, PGA at the end of your, oh. uh, at, at the end of your name as a producer or something like that to like, you're a producer. Anybody, and trust me, I, I live in LA, so everybody's a producer here and everybody walks up and they give you a business card and I'm like, hey, I'm a producer. I have, I have various projects in multiple stages of development. Uh, of, course. And, of course you do. Uh, and all this kind of stuff. And you know, you know, I'm guys, sure they're all wonderful. <laughs> and I'm sure, and I'm sure they're all fantastic. And it goes, yeah, we've been talking to, uh, we've been talking to uh, Marty about this thing. I'm like, I'm sure you have. Uh, <laughs> what have you done what before? Have what have you done before? <laughs> what have you done before? I've done two shorts. I'm like, that seems like a solid business plan, but, um, <laughs> but that's just the business the problem solving problem solving. And, you know, part of the first problem is, you know, how do I get this in the hands of someone that could actually pay for it, be in it, uh, direct it? You know, that's the first problem, right? Problem so, number one is. So how do you, up. so how do you develop a project from scratch? How do you, how do you approach that problem? And as I mean, cause some movies, I think you're, look, you're, you're a producer on, uh, and then some yeah. of your executive producers on. So some right. more financiers, some more. Most are executive, which is where I'm more involved, as I say, in the financial arrangements and structuring and hopefully deal gathering side. Mm -hmm. But I have, um, you know, done a number of producing from scratch, like The Foreigner, my, my uh, yeah. film with Jackie Chan, Martin Campbell, 
um, was a book that I um, optioned for, called The Chinaman by Stephen Leather, which I was given by my late father to read when I was a, a young boy who didn't read. Another thing that, you know, great life lesson, read. Read a lot. Read, yeah. read a lot, read everything, understand what people are making and why they're getting made. I mean, it, it, like it's all there for you. You know, anyone who says to me, oh, I don't understand. I got this stuff. It's not, no one's liking it. And they don't read or look at why the things that are getting made are getting made and what were the things that made that happen. But so, yes, um, I have developed a number of things from scratch. And the, for, um, the Foreigner, if you remind me, The Foreigner is the one with um, who else was in it besides Jackie? Uh, Jackie Chan, Pierce Brosnan. That's, I did uh, see, I, 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 that's what I thought. Yeah, I love that film. Loved it. I love that film. Yeah, Jackie was amazing. Jackie was amazing, amazing um, in that film. Was, what is it? What is it? By my good friend David Marconi, uh, directed by Martin Campbell, who made two Bond movies. Yeah. Uh, so, so how we, do you? So look, Jackie. So Jackie's a legend, man. Like he's like a legend. a legend. Like he's so legendary. How was it working with Jackie on set? Like because you were a producer on that, so you you were on set with that. that. I, was, so, I was PGA, whatever that means. Yeah, whatever that thing. Yeah, exactly. So how how was it working with? I mean, a genius. I mean, he's a genius. He is. He is. He is the hardest working and just most unbelievable talent. And Martin Campbell. Who oh, amazing! I love Martin. Oh. Unbelievable director. But he, he, you know, he puts actors through their paces. He, you know, again, 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 and he knows what he wants and how he wants it, and he doesn't stop until he gets it. And working with. Uh, you know, people like Jackie and, and, and Piers, it's just amazing to be around such incredible talent. And these guys have made movies for so many years. They, uh, And when you look at action and the way that Jackie, um, you know, architects a fight scene and creates that with the stunt crew and with the director, and with the idea of the vision of the movie and how the action inter inter interrelates, it's incredible to see. And is, he, is he still it's doing inspiring. The energy is inspiring. You know, it keeps you going. You look at when a 65 year old, you know, incredible talent is got the energy and is up and is glowing like that. You know, it makes it lifts everyone around you. Is he still doing his stunts? He is. God, no. Gee, but yeah, he's doing them. He's he nuts. Is the he is the man. <laughs> and you know what? He's not just doing them. You know, the, you, you create. You know, you're designing the sequences and the fight. You know, really? the fights are as well, which is just so much work and the meticulous attention to detail that goes into everything you see is exceptional. It blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind. Wow, um, that, that, that must be amazing people. Um, and the whole crew that go with him. You know, the, his oh no, yeah, I heard, I've heard. Yeah, his it's legendary. His team, just amazing. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's uh, remarkable. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you as a financier, because this is the biggest dilemma filmmakers have when they're packaging a project. It's the chicken and egg dilemma. Oh, I, I got. Jumped. I need cast before I can get money, but I need money to get cast. How do you do it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> fake it till you make it. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Um, it's really hard. It's super hard. Um, you know, even when you've made a bunch of movies, the difference is when you say you can fund or you can pay someone something, you know, there's a little more, more believability in it maybe sure. now for me. Sure. So if I'm calling an agent or an actor and saying, listen, we'd like to make an offer and, you know, this is what we can pay, you know, I'm only doing that knowing that I can deliver that. Um, you know, obviously, when you're starting, you may eat your stick and egg. You know that if you're able to land X actor, the finances will come rolling. It's really hard. I mean, increasingly, um, it's. I guess it's getting even harder because the competition with film and TV as well now. And um, uh, yeah, it's. I wish I had an answer for you. The only thing I can say is, um, the great stories rise to the top actors yeah. gravitate towards great roles great parts and great stories and so you ha in my view you have to if you can't afford the number you have to position the project as a must-do project it's not about the money now that won't be music to the agents ears, but for the actor who may be getting you know a dozen opportunities a month or more they want to do things that are going to move their, you know, their career forward or move their their value. Uh, yeah, their value as their an value. actor. But even just their, 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 
their interests. And so think about who you're going after and why this part, this role, this movie means will mean something to them because you can't just dangle the check that's going to make them pay attention. It's got to be centered around the part and the role. And, 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 and I think dressing up offers with really personalized letters and visions from the director, um, because ultimately the director vision is key when approaching talent. And so, you know, really be creative about how you position your movie and the opportunity to the actor. Do a video of the director talking to the actor like he's in the room, pitching the role. Is he more likely to watch a three minute video or read your email and script? Maybe he might just read the three, he might watch the three minute video. I don't know, maybe not. But it might stand out over the email. It might stand out over the whole script. So get them into the story. Get them looking at the part and fake it. You know, the money's good. We got the money. It's coming. We got it. Now, there's so many, you know, and I run this, I ran into this so much in my career, uh, and I was this early on in my career, you probably were a little bit as well, is the delusional factor, where you are like, like that guy I was just making it fun of, like, I was like, oh, yeah, I got this card, I'm a producer, and I'm, yeah, I'm talking to Marty, and like, there's this delusional factor, and there's a lot of this goes on, and some of it is very conscious, like, I'm, I'm just trying to boast myself up, fake it till you make it kind of scenarios, and then there's, People who really, truly are delusional, like completely delusional about like, I'm going to pick, I've had conversations. Yeah, we're pitching this to Tom Cruise. I'm like, are you, are you, are you crazy? Like, that's, like, come on. like are you, time. why, like, but that, but that's the delusion. Like, oh, he's, this is the part for him. It's going to be the thing. And I'm like, guys, look, look at the track no, record. <laughs> I, I say that, but when I started, I was 25 years old mm -hmm. and I approached Jackie Chan to be in a movie that had no money, really. It had nothing. And, but I knew, you know, I had a 65 year old Asian lead that there was only really four or five actors in the world that could play this part. And he was number one. He was number one. And so you knock on the door and you try. And actually, I should tell you the first time, it was a no. It took time and tenacity and hustle and staying with it and also talking to Donnie Yen and Andy Lau and Chow Yun Fat and going through the process to eventually have all the right things in place to then end up closing the deal. How many years did that take? How many years did that take? From first uh, trying to attack, because we took a few years to write and adapt the book to the script, because um, I was, again, <clears throat> I had no money and I had a, an amazing writer in Dave Marconi who wrote Enemy of the State, Mission Impossible 2, um, you know, fantastic array of movies. And it wasn't being paid, which is not unreasonable. Um, but I had to kind of piecemeal it together. So that took a couple of years. But by the time we finally started the journey of packaging, I think it took about three years. To, from, the, from the moment you started to the moment you attached Jackie? From the moment I had a script I could go out with. Right. And then how long did it take you before, from the beginning of the project to the very end when you're shooting? Seven years. Seven years. Okay. So I don't consider that delusional. I, you're, you're, you're going for it at that point, And then you actually are creating things that make that happen as opposed to, here's a script, Tom Cruise. You should understand that I'm a genius and you need to work with me. That's the delusion. And I'm sure you've run into these guys. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm probably one of these guys, right? Because at times... <laughs> But it works, right? But no, you're right. And, and, and I think that you remember earlier we were talking about what is the right, uh, uh, you know, um, framework for this movie. It's the same as distribution. It's the same as talent. It's the same as amount of money you're raising. Don't raise a million dollar movie and try and get Tom Hardy. I mean, it's never going to work. You know, it's not the right fit. Go and get the best person in that kind of category of budget and, and, and everything. Because just having a major star on a movie has its costs that come with it, let alone the fee for them. There is a certain amount of costs that come with just having major talent along yep. with the movie. Yep. And that, that's, you know, just because you've got a little bit of money isn't always enough. So I think it is always about positioning yourself with the right and approach. That doesn't mean you shouldn't aim high. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have aspirations mm -hmm. to go for the best. Correct. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't try and hustle. But there is a 
there is a if you if you're trying to make uh, you know as you say hits at the biggest and the best you know a you got to be prepared to wait a long time a long time because you got to be patient when you're dealing with people that are the best in an industry in any industry they're busy they're good at what they do they're going to be busy you are not a priority so if you're happy to wait then great but there's pressure with waiting and you know it's, it, 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 it eats it eats you so you've right. got to be doing a lot of things, juggling a lot of balls, or manage your expectations. Be real, be practical, and get it. And my view would be, isn't it worth just getting this made and making another one and another one? And maybe in three or four movies, because you've gone from 2 million to 5 million to 9 million to 50 million, now you're doing the 40 million film with Tom Cruise. Well, Tom, Tom's not doing 40 million, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you in and say hi. He might, he might, he might come in and say hi. Yeah, absolutely. depends on who the director is, and no, you never know. Sure. I know, of course, of course. No, of course, of course. Um, now, uh, do you do you would you recommend reaching out to actors directly through their through their production companies and seeing if that's an angle of like bringing them into the financial, bringing them into. A, as a producer, because that might be more appetizing, as opposed to just going directly through agents? I, absolutely. I would be trying every angle possible to try and um, position myself as a project that should be on the radar of the target actor, whether it be through their production entity, through their agent, through their management, through the guy that's the valet at the best restaurant they go to. If there is a route in, you got to try and navigate. That's the hustle, right, Alex? It's about getting <laughs> in the door, okay? I've got, I was involved in a film called War With Grandpa. Yeah. Um, and it's a um, fantastic story. And the producer of that film um, had the best hustle story of how he got the script to De Niro. Mm -hmm. And he just was relentless and wouldn't accept no. And then he would you know, leave them everywhere and hand them to everyone around him. And ultimately, eventually, De Niro read it, needed, you know, basically engaged in the project, although there was a lot of work that had to be done before he attached. But it got through a process and boom, he's in the film. His number one choice. Was it easy? No. Did he hustle it? Yes. It was commendable. And I I find that those stories are inspiring. They they make me feel like great about life because you're like, yes, there is a way. You don't have to always have, you know, buckets of cash and, you know, be perfect. You can do it. And it isn't easy. But yes, of course, if you feel but 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 going smart, look at what the slate is, look at what they gravitate towards. Don't go and send uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's production company something that, that he would never gravitate towards and they've never made, they've never associated with. Do your homework, research, understand what these businesses and people are, are, are doing and making. And it's not always easy, but there is so much information available on the web and there's so much access to information now that the more prepared you can be to go in to engage with anyone, director, producer, financier, do your homework. Now, you mentioned something a little bit ago, which I really doesn't get talked about as much. But if you're lucky enough to get one of these guys or gals who come onto your show, a, 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 a named talent, you're like, great, I, I, I raised a million dollars and I'm paying X star to show up for five days for a million dollars. And you're like, solid. But then you forget that with that, they're not going to sit in a chair and drink, you know, Kool-Aid. Like, you, you got to get them a trailer. There's going to probably be an entourage. There's going to probably be... So there's cost involved. And a lot, I've seen other producers who are like, oh, we weren't ready for this. It, kill, it killed our budget because, you know, Nick Cage showed up. Not saying that's Nick Cage, but Nick Cage showed up. Someone like Nick Cage showed up. He's like, I need... What's, what's my trailer? What is that? I can't go in that. Like, yeah. you, all these I mean, things that you're not aware of. Uh, you're absolutely right. And look, everyone is different. And, oh, of course. You know, fair to generalize. But... But there is an associated and an expected level of professionalism. Uh, professionalism and support. You know, you don't change in the back of a room where there's a little curtain if you are, you know, uh, in the middle of nowhere. You, you need a private place with a, you know, with a place for them to, you know, have, 
you know, do what they do to do, get in the zone, prep. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. The the you know the 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 support and the uh, budgeting requirements that go with any major talent um, is often under thought of in independent film production. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yes. And- and 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 it's a it's it's a shame because you know in some respects it's like well it seems like a waste but it's not you you can't look at it like that it's about professionalism and trust me they will feel better they will come on set you know free ready to work ready to be, you know do what you want them to do in the best in the best shape and the the challenge comes I find not always about you know packaging for the the, the major star that's coming but then how that um, you know that affects the rest of the of the cast and the rest of the crew who may, you know what I mean? Like because you're like, okay, well we throw all the bells and whistles out for so and so, and then the rest of you, you're in there, mate. You know, you're in the the, the big the, the bus. We got a bus for you. All of you can sit in the bus. It's, it's great. It's warm. It's not air conditioned. It's not air conditioned. It's not air. <laughs> it's not air conditioned. But there's fans. We got fans. Um, um, you got you got brown bag lunches so uh, while he's eating. I think yeah. it's, about, it's about thinking about the overall and, and the other things is just have a conversation. Again, communication is key. The biggest mistake to make is just assume it will be OK. That's the mistake. <laughs> it's OK to say, listen, we don't have the budget for this. We would we're going to make you as comfortable as possible. This is our proposal. This is how we're going to do it. Is that going to be OK? Um, we can give a bit here, but we can't do that. Communicate, communicate, communicate. As soon as you just assume, well, they'll turn up, and we'll, we'll we'll be all right. I'll deal. We'll with figure it out. Day. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. That's where the problems happen. That's when you get people with their back up, and you, you're off to a bad start. Right, and um, yeah, that's the thing that a lot of people don't talk about either. It's just the the politics of all of this. This is psychology. This is human behavior you're 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 being almost a politician on how to negotiate egos and and agendas and you know maybe they had a bad night the night before and how you have to deal with that like i always ask my hairdressers and my hair my hair my hair and makeup department i'm like how how are they doing because yeah, they're the first ones to hear what happened they're the first ones to hear what happened the night before like oh i had a fight with my girlfriend or oh my boyfriend cheated on me like okay you want to know these things before they step on set so i always ask my hair and makeup department that kind of stuff but that is something that so so how do you you know you can get it driver as well you know yeah you know they're always great (laughs) was he talkative on the way in this morning you know did she have a coffee (laughs) And this is, but this is this is the weird and it's just just an insane world that we live in in movie in the movie business where our entire you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of that millions of dollars on the day are riding on did they have their coffee <laughs> sometimes you know you're 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 throwing together a you know a collective of personalities and experiences in one go and hoping it all gels together to make this magic. Right. And sometimes it comes together and it's beautiful and everyone's like, you're my best friends. I will love you forever. Right? Yes. You know, I'm yeah, going to yeah. see you at my wedding. Um, and <laughs> others, you're like, I never want to hear from you again. Please don't call. I don't care how good the job is. I'm not interested. Um, you're a nightmare. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a complete concoction. Right. Um, and, you know, even when you do the, you know, every film's different. And that's also awesome as well. That's one of the most magical things about what we do and how and the world we're in is that you meet amazing people and you you work with amazing people who are brilliant what they do and but sometimes it clicks and sometimes it doesn't and the personalities arriving and where all the eyes are focusing and all the attention is focusing can gel together beautifully and they can be really um not um and managing those situations is also a really important job of the director and potentially the producers as well to really hope for the best result because it's one thing coming and doing the job mm-hmm. reading the lines turning up you know putting in a good day's work but it's another thing coming and like shining in that day and and as a filmmaker and as a producer as an owner of a business and an asset you want everyone to shine um so how do you create a working environment to nurture that and support that um and encourage it 
And that's why I love that you keep saying business and asset because it's something I've been yelling from the top of the mountain for a long time. And filmmakers a lot of times get caught up with the magic of it's it's art, it's story. And we are in this, this crossroads between business, it's show and business. And and as a producer friend of mine mm-hmm. says, and as, as a producer friend of mine says, the word business has twice as many letters as the word show, and there's a reason. Uh, so, because it, it is this art form mixed with business, and a lot of the artists just want to focus on the art, and the business want to focus on the business, and we have to find this happy balance, happy medium. But you have to, as a filmmaker, keep thinking, this is a business first. We're creating an art form within the, the realm of a business, of an asset that is going to be sold in the marketplace. And you have to think that way. And all the greats, all those directors I just mentioned from Herzog and Scorsese, and they all understand it. They're amazing artists, but they understand the business of it. They do. And you know why? Because you respect the fact it's a business and you keep getting the work. You keep getting the opportunity to make more. It's not a hobby. It can be a hobby. It can be it's expensive that hobby. Wonderful, but it's it, yeah. But then don't then treat it like a hobby. Then make films for fun and enjoy the process, and don't worry about the monetization. That's all upside if it happens, but that's not the thing. But the majority of us in this industry live by what we make. We support our families by how we how well we do with our work, and therefore. In the same respect you'd have for a teacher turning up to teach your kids or a doctor going to look at, you know, your thing or a mechanic fixing your car. We are making um, movies. We are making assets that hopefully will entertain wide audiences. And that's great. But the aim of the day, the aim for me anyway, is to make something for less than you get for when you sell it. That's got to be the aim. That's that's business. That's that's yeah. just business. That's I had a, I had a conver- right? I had I had a conversation with a, a filmmaker at AFM, um, and they 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 ran up to me and they're like, Alex, Alex, I had a I got a deal, I got an MG. I'm like, great. What was your MG? Like, we got thirty five thousand dollar MG. I'm like, fantastic. What was your budget? He's like, it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So what rights you're did on the way. you're on the way? What rights did you sell? All of them. Okay. How how long? Nine years. And they were ecstatic about it. They're like, we we sold it, we got. It. I'm like, but that's not what business in the world does that make sense? Like that's a that's a you're going to that's, that's a hobby camp. That's a hobby, Alex, but that's the hobby camp. That's the hobby camp. And you know, there's oh, there's God. It's hard. It is hard. And you know what we're in is we're in a we're in a, in a brutal industry. It costs a lot. The barrier to entry, although technology and cost of production are down, the barrier to entry is high. The competition is gr- you know vast. And whilst there arguably has never been a better time to make a movie and get it exploited and distributed because of the likes of Avod, because of the um, direct distribution channels to an audience, which is amazing and a wonderful opportunity. It's, it's, it's super difficult. It's super hard. And, you know, focus on story building the best version of whatever that story is then find the right director and talent that will enhance that project that doesn't mean it has to be the megastar it needs to be the right level and then financing it appropriately to what that package looks like now you did a movie called 47 meters down which i remember when it came out and it exploded it was like a huge box office hit and it you know, arguably, I'm a fan of Mandy Moore. I watch This Is Us. I, I love Mandy, but she's not a huge box office star. She's not, you know, she's not, you know, bringing in t- t- tons of cash. But yet, this movie exploded, and it was like on a five million dollar budget or something like that. If I you read know, correctly, that tell me the story behind that. Tell me the story behind that. That must have been amazing. So, so um, Mark Lane and James Harris um, came to me with uh, the project. They had already shot a promo with Johannes, the director, that was, you know, a minute and a half visual effects promo of a shark, basically. Sure. And it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And I guess this promo cost them 40 grand, uh, 35 grand, 40 grand, and they had uh, got this amazing visual effects house in the UK, in, in, in Bournemouth, that were new and hungry. And they put this together, 
and they went to Cannes or Berlin and they pre-sold the movie by about two and a half million straight away. And then <laughs> off of a shark the engine, the Weinsteins bought it for a million off a promo and a script and a director. That's it. No talent at this right. stage. Right. And so they were looking to find a way to finance the film. And, uh, you know, as was the kind of focus of me, you know, what I was doing back then, lending against these pre-sale distribution contracts, a UK tax credit, and then putting up some, if you like, gap or equity against the rest of the world felt like a smart play given the amazing uh, work that the pre and altitude uh, were the film sales agent. They were, they did a terrific job, terrific job off this promo. And, so we 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 uh, we made a deal. We we worked with them to finance the movie and produce the film, and they executed a terrific movie. And I would say that at the time, you know, um, Bob um, Weinstein would you know feedback his notes, and everyone was looking good about a, a big theatrical release. And then we got to finishing the movie, and I remember we were in Cannes, we screened it for them. Um, privately as we did to some of the buyers and they turned around and said, no, we're not going to release it. It's going to go straight to DVD. And we were bummed. We thought we had a great movie. We obviously were, you know, not, not relying, but really hopeful that the theatrical release would really give us the, the, mm -hmm. the upside we, we all were, were, were counting on. And so we managed to negotiate a deal where we could buy back the rights from North America and by the way, they were phenomenal uh, at the time. Bob, the notes he gave, the, the, they invested more money to do reshoots. We made a great move, but they just decided it wasn't going to get a release. So we managed to have a window of time to rebuy the movie by repaying their investment and their MG um, and a little uplift, a significant uplift. But the condition was we couldn't sell to any of their competitors. That's a really, I mean, so, who, so no studio, no uh, what they got as a conversion, no Lionsgate, none of that. So we ended up having to have a very narrow pool of almost independent distributors, smaller distributors. And we did a screening. And amazingly, we managed to get the attention of Byron Allen. Mm -hmm. um, and he and his team there just, jumped on it they loved it they saw the potential of this film and in a in a but the weinstein decided that they were always going to release the movie um on a certain date and we had till that date to to buy it back and the thing was dragging we got to release day and the dvd dropped it was in target it was in walmart it was everywhere on the day we dropped the movie we bought the movie back Byron went with a check down the beach and gave a check, got the deal done. We recalled the movie five hours later off the shelves and then rebuilt the whole movie up a year later to do the theatrical release. Wow. It was one of the most crazy experiences I've ever been involved with. Right. The stress uh, and the excitement. And then Byron and his team did an unbelievable job. They put up a stupid amount of P&A money for a tiny little movie. They went everywhere and he went nuts. And, you know, we also had the benefit in that year that This Is Us dropped. Mandy Moore suddenly, who was always a great actress, but suddenly yeah. became a star overnight, like within the year while we were messing around with all this stuff. And that helped us a lot. And um, Claire Holt as well. I mean, we, we just had an amazing, amazing achievement. And Johannes did a phenomenal job, went on to make a sequel. Um, it was just one of those amazing stories, but it came together really by the um, the smart approach that the filmmakers took to make a 35, 30, 40 grand promo of a minute and a half of a shark that looked amazing, that, that just basically pitched this story and managed to pre-sell the movie off the back of it with no talent. That's insane. Significant pre-sales yeah. and, and 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 actually it's an amazing opportunity that if you have you know the right kind of genre the right kind of movie it can be a fantastic strategy to raise five million seven million for a movie off the back of a killer promo a killer trailer 
And actually, so that small seed investment to really create a sizzle to then go and uh, to go and sell it in the market can be a fantastic solution. But um, an amazing story. That's an array. That's like that's a, like a lottery ticket. When we had to call people that legitimately bought the DVD in Target and tell them they had to send it back to us. How did you, really? Because we were, we were called every DVD because it was, uh, and it wasn't called uh, 47 Meters Down. It was called uh, in, uh, Into the Deep, they called it. Okay. Um, and so um, we had to recall every DVD. We were getting piracy things going everywhere. We had to recall all that. We had a year of... With all of this story, it was it was amazing. But you know, to what the credit, what an amazing every- story! What an amazing that does not happen. There's nothing like that happens. And I, someone sent me. I don't even know if I've got one here. I, I mean, I'd love to. I don't know where I've got it, but literally, you go into a tie, you could have bought it off the shelf legitimately in the morning. By the afternoon, it was gone. <laughs> gone. <laughs> then a year later. You could- See the cinema. It was fun. That's amazing. Uh, now I want to ask you a few. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Don't do it. Go and do I mean, something. Just go, I mean, be an accountant. Be an accountant. Go bake a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, just um, I, I've, I've drummed on this a lot today, but story is the start. Focus on story. Build the best version of whatever it is. Spend the time in script. Spend the time in really, really believing in what you're making. And make sure that when you do get the opportunity and you do get in front of that actor, don't blow it. (laughs) Be prepared. Research. Be prepared. Okay. And what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? I would say that... um, Happiness is not the destination, but the journey. Amen. And I think I struggled for many years in the destination and trying to get that happiness and that hit and that adrenaline. But actually, you look back over your shoulder, and we talked a bit about some of the experiences today, but that's the joy. The journey is the joy. So enjoy the ride. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the no's. Enjoy the yeses. And um, and um you know the success comes from the journey and not arriving at the destination and three of your favorite films of all time oh God, I <laughs> this is your podcast and here i am here i am not nothing more to say um the station agent yeah great movie great movie, great movie. um i would say um uh, I mean, I love some of The Rock. I would say is one I, of my favorite all-time action movies. Can, can we can we stop there for a second? I, I I've said this before and I'll say it again. Whether you like Michael Bay or not, Michael Bay changed the way action films are made. Just 100%. like just like Tony Scott did when Tony Scott showed up. Before Tony Scott and there's after Tony Scott, before Michael Bay and after Michael Bay, before The Matrix and after The Matrix. There are certain yeah. movies that change the way they yeah. do it. The rock he he touch he touches it in Bad Boys, but The Rock is the film and, that, and it's yeah, my favorite. Uh, my favorite, the definitive action movie of my youth. Of, oh, you know, made me love action movies the way I, and I, it's, I, I love them. And it's a solid story, and it's amazing solid. action, and the lines, and, oh. and just the relationship oh, between Sean Connery. The and, oh, I know. Amazing. And if Amazing. and if and if you want a little bit more cheese, you can go watch Armageddon, which I also enjoy, but at a different level. <laughs> All right, and your third uh, one. Um, most recently, I think you know I loved uh, Parasite as well. Yeah. In recent, great. recent, uh, recent years, but yeah, I mean, I love movies. I love all films. I mean, I like bad movies. I like good movies. I just love that ex- uh, the escapism of our craft. Did you did you see the room? You've seen the room, right? Of course. Of course, the room. Right? Not... The room. Yeah. The room is 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 a genius film, uh, and uh, everyone listening to the podcast knows I'm a, just a fanatic of, of the room and of Tommy Wiseau and everything that that movie has done. But um, but did you see it by yourself or did you see it with other people? Because I I don't 
And probably other people. Yeah, because that's a movie you can't watch by yourself. You need to watch it with a group, especially if you're a filmmaker, with a group of filmmakers. I saw it with a group of filmmakers at Sundance one night in, in a loft while we were shooting my movie there. And no one really? no one on the crew had seen it except for me. I'm like, oh, we're getting it tonight and we're all watching it. And everyone's just sitting there going, is he using the same stock footage shot twice? Why Why is he humping her, her, her stomach? What's going on? Like, it, there's so much going on in that movie. It is so brilliantly bad. Um, what are your what are your top three? Is that one of them? No, well, I mean, as, as it's the it's the best as worst. A, it's the best worst movie I've ever seen. Um, I just you just enjoy it. There's I always tell people this. I'm like, there's bad, and then there's bad that transcends good. So it gets so bad that it is good, and it and you can't you can't go after that. It happens naturally. You can't make a bad movie and hope that people will love it because. The intention is wrong. The reason why the room is beloved by millions around the world is because Tommy Wiseau was trying to make the greatest film of all time. That is why it is so brilliant. But when you try to make a cult film or a bad movie, people understand no, you're never gonna you're, you're never, never gonna, gonna do it. it. But the, because there was such sincerity in the making of it, and it's like <laughs> I can't don't get me so I'm only seeing his lines and scenes flying oh. into, <laughs> into my head. So um, for me, I always, I always, my favorites are, I, I always say, Sha um, the three that I could just throw off the top today, Shawshank, um, Fight Club, uh, and The Matrix. I mean, those are, I mean, they just, they, they work. And, and of course, The Godfather, and of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and of course, Jaws, and, yeah. and of course, uh, you know, Taxi Driver, and of course, all these other amazing films. But those are the three that, like, they're remote control thrower ways. Like if, if you're watching something, you're like, oh, it's on, gone. I have to just, I just have to watch it, you know. But just, and I love those sort of movies where no matter where you land in them, you immediately pick up, can pick them up like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and Fight Club and Time. Time. Time, the, timeless, timeless, and of course everything Kubrick almost, and almost anything Kubrick made. Um, just I'm a huge, ridiculous Kubrick fan. Uh, one day I'll make the pilgrimage to uh, to England to the archives there at the school and oh, well, we'll take you to a football <laughs> game you know we can you know hey, fun. i can't wait now can you tell people where they can find out more about purely capital um the, amazingly purely dot capital it's just all in the title <laughs> um so find us on purely and all your social medias but but all means um, you know check us out purely dot capital um, and if you have any long dated contracted revenues we will happily let you get them sooner um, and um, anyone got uh, you know any ideas about how to improve uh, the um, lack of transparency around our industry we're also excited to hear about those sorts of ideas so we can try and help build products that will give you those tools. Wayne, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. And thank I you so you. much for coming on the show. And I, I hope this episode uh, helps a few people. We, we've thrown out a lot of information and a lot of information I'm sure you would have liked to have known 20 years ago. And I definitely would have liked to know 20 years ago. You know, what? Well, the best thing, you know, to look at today is that we are in, um, a, you know, an established industry that is still finding its feet and changing today. And that's what's amazing, you know, and tomorrow will be different. So mm -hmm. just um, just just keep hustling. Right. Amen, brother. Thank you, brother.